It's time to get the breakdown started. First up, 10 observations. It's first and 10. Number one. The commanders straight up, flat out, handled their business yesterday. And I mean that in a very literal sense. Not only are they 7-2, first time they've been that since 1996, but that was a very business-like win in general. It was a professional win. The Giants are not good. They are a team that if you got up on them early, Brandon Tierney talked about it with us last week, they would probably roll over and die a little bit. And credit to the Giants, they didn't fully die. But there was never a point that the Commanders were really stressed. That's not to say there weren't points in the game that were stressful, but realistically, the Commanders were not stressed for basically the entirety of that game. They were able to get out to a lead. Uh, They were able to hold that lead. And there was no point in the second half where the Giants had the ball and a chance to take the lead. And that comes down to the absolutely just savage, a nearly six-minute drive that ends in a field goal to get them to 27. Giants come down, credit to them, score to make it 27-22, and they never get the ball back. And had they, it would have been because uh, the commanders decided to score a touchdown and put the game out of reach. Instead, they kneel on the ball three times at the end of the game. This was a business handling type of win, and it is really fun because this is the type of win that you come to expect from this team. And it is the exact opposite of how any of us that have followed this team for the decade now that I have been, basically, or the previous 15 years before I got here, basically going back to the last time this team was a Super Bowl contender under Joe Gibbs, it's been that long. So for many of you listening, your literal entire whole lives that you could rely on the commanders to do exactly what they are supposed to do. And they did yesterday, and they deserve credit for that, especially considering they did not have perhaps their most business-like, most reliable player. Number two, please. Number two. They ran the ball for nearly 150 yards without Brian Robinson. This run game is legit, and they probably would have pushed... I mean, I don't want to say, like, oh, they would have rushed for 200 yards, but it would have been more with Robinson. That's pretty clear. Like, some of the McNichols and Eckler carries that didn't go very far, uh, which ultimately is why Chris Rodriguez comes in, and we'll talk about him more as we go here, but why C-Rod had such a big day yesterday because they found the back uh, that was was best, and the guy that was best was the guy that was most like the guy that was missing. And B-Rob is an even better version than Chris Rodriguez. And he's a more versatile guy, so it could have opened up other things in their offense. But even with that said, Rodriguez, 11 carries, 52 yards, 4.7 per carry. And there was a a play in this game that I think just perfectly uh, kind of illustrates how nasty this run game is. That the, the mix of personnel, design, and, and everything just being maximized. And it came to a point where the run game had stalled a little bit. Commanders got in that, that huge drive in the fourth quarter. Uh, they started actually with two one-yard runs. That was it. They were in, they were in bad down in distances. Uh, they got to a third and nine, and that's when uh, Jaden just fades and fades and fades, then finds Eckler wide open. Eckler chips, gets out. Nobody picks him up. Jaden finds him. It's like a 30-something yard gain. All of a sudden, it's first and 10. They run the ball again with Jeremy McNichols. One-yard gain, second and nine. Yikes, man. we got two one-yard carries in a row. What's going on here? How can we open up this run game a little bit? And this play, second and nine, 7.23 to go in the ball game, is the kind of thing that Cliff has in his literal bag. They run an RPO where the, the pass option is a bubble to Diami, who has been killer in those situations this year. So they, they run Diami in motion. Eyes are going to him. Uh, the corner follows him. Some of the contained players stay outside because the threat is there of that pass option. And then on the run side of it, I got to talk to Logan to see if there's a different name for this. I'm going to call it counter trap, where Andrew Wiley blocks down on the defensive end. So you got the old Vince Lombardi. We got a seal here. And then John Bates fakes towards the defensive end or the outside linebacker, the edge player, on that side, and then gets to the second level. So that edge player is like, sick, I'm free. And here comes Sam Cosme coming around, looping, and smacks the ever-living living hell out of this dude. There's your other Lombardi and a seal there. And you got eight yards for Jeremy McNichols untouched into the second level. We got, we got counter trap where it's 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 – we got a counter one way, Jeremy McNichols faking coming back. Like, it is 
It is a nasty play design. And at a point where the run game had stalled, they just kept trying different stuff. And it's, it's really, really impressive how they continue to do that stuff. Maybe you call it a power trap. I don't know. We got pullers. We got wham players. We got trap players. We got an RPO attached to it. All I know is it got eight yards, got them to third and one. Mid Nichols then picks up, picks up the first down, and they continue to march down the field until they get a field goal. And that is the kind of play that this team will make. Cliff does a tremendous job of finding whatever the right thing is, and that actually leads us to the final part of our first uh, half of our first and ten. Number three. Which is the situational football dominance of the Washington Commanders. What a sentence. Oh, my God. If you had asked me three years ago if I would ever say that phrase, I might say no. Uh, things, things have changed a little bit. Thank goodness. Um, and, and I give credit to Dan Quinn uh, in a major way on this because they practice this stuff. Logan has talked about on Take Command that when he was with Dan in Atlanta, they practiced more situational football than any other stop in his career, including when he was with Kyle Shanahan, including when he was with Mike Shanahan here. Like, real professional coaches who know what they're doing and have been good in those situations uh, on some level historically. Kyle, I know, he's got some notable uh, not-ideal fo situational football things, so I'm not going to let that slide. But the point is, DQ practice it more than anyone else. And it shows because, as, D as Dan calls them, the winning time plays, they make them again and again and again. And I think the bigger part of that, or just as big of a part as the players' preparation, is the coaches. I cannot believe Brian Dable screwed up that end-of-game situation as badly as he did. As he does. Washington runs the ball, gets one yard. It's second and nine with, like, 48 seconds left. Call timeout, Dable. What are you doing? Like, then Washington's going to run the ball again. You get another stuff. Now it's third and – even say they get five yards, like it's third and short. They're probably going to run it again, make you use your timeouts. Now uh, you get the ball back above the two-minute warning, and you still have the two-minute warning to work with, obviously, as you get back on offense. That's a good situation if you can stop the run. Instead, the Giants let it run all the way down, and Cliff was ready for this. Cliff called a play as if to say, hey, if you're not going to call timeout, we're calling a pass here because if the if the ball falls incomplete, the clock stops anyway because of the two-minute warning. It's a free pass. 42 yards to Alameda Zacchaeus Slater. Bang, bang, bang. Commanders are in field goal range. They're able to run out the clock, uh, kick the field goal, and that pretty much is, is game over. Um, actually, sorry, that was game over. That was when they ran out the clock. That wasn't on the, the longer field goal drive. So that's excellent. The end of half where they get the ball back with like six minutes left and drive it all the way down and then hit the TD to Terry. Part of the reason that takes so long is because they get penalties and backed up and then have to overcome that, but they do. They're just ready for every situation and they make winning time plays. And the, the thoroughness where they have not really been caught out situationally at all this year like, watch the NFL on any given Sunday. Watch every other game and watch how many coaches mess this stuff up. And between Dan and shout out to Dave Gardy, who they hired out of the league office for in part this specific reason because he was a master of situations. He helped design some of the rules. And they're like, what if he worked for us? And Josh Harris was like, cool, write the check. Now they're the best situational team arguably in the NFL. Good stuff. Good stuff. Love that. Don't waste... Uh, time score situations and the commanders not only just don't mess them up they maximize them in this game while the Giants just absolutely uh, they they did a bad job I'm not going to use any any analogies I'm just going to straight they they were bad they were very very bad number four Jaden Daniels in this game per next gen stats completed every deep pass that he threw there were only three of them but he was three of three for 91 yards and a touchdown on passes over 20 yards in the air. Shots are hard to come by in the NFL, especially when you have t teams that know we cannot give them up. And so when you get opportunities, you better hit them. And it requires a ton of patience. It requires a lot of, hey, we got it called here. Oh, it's not there. Check it down. Oh, it's not called here. Oh, it's not there. The deep one, but the intermediate is. Let's hit that and get a nice little chunk that way. Oh, oh there it is. Got to throw it right now. And so you always have to be aggressive in throwing it while also understanding that you can't throw it all the time. 
Uh, and Jaden finds that balance beautifully. And then the hard part is obviously the most difficult part is can you complete it? The ball's farther away. If I were told you you have $100, where do you want me to place the target? Would you want it right in front of your face or would you want it 40 yards away? You probably want it right in front of your face. Uh, and so the efficiency that he shows on the deep ball is such a huge factor in this offense because it also keeps them uh, the opponent from overloading the box and allows the success in the run that we just talked about and all that kind of stuff. Overall, just how valuable and how accurate has he been? How above average? Daniels has generated 25 and a half expected points added on deep passes this season, third most in the NFL behind Rodgers and Sam Darnold. Dang. That is a massive, massive number. Uh, thanks again to Next Gen Stats for that. And for this. Number five. Helps when you have offensive line uh, play that is high quality. How good was the commander's offensive line yesterday? Actually, Anthony, I'm going to hit you with a pop quiz. I don't think you're ready for this. That's the, that's the, that's the nature of a pop quiz, unless you've been looking at the rundown where all my notes are. Um, what percent... And of, of the, the commander's, commander's uh, uh, what percent of the commander's snaps did the Giants blitz on yesterday? Uh, twenty-two. Felt pretty low, right? Yeah. What if I told you it was sixty? Sixty percent, according to Next Gen Stats, the Giants' defense blitzed. On 60% of dropbacks, their highest blitz rate in a game this season yesterday. They generated five pressures, zero sacks on those 25 dropbacks, which is just a 20% pressure rate. All right, so 25 total dropbacks. One, they didn't drop back a ton. Two, they generated five pressures on 25 dropbacks. That's 20% despite blitzing 60% of Jaden's dropbacks. Aziz Ojolari finished with two pressures on the day, was the Giants' only defender with multiple pressures. He might not be a Giant by the weekend. Uh, Dexter Lawrence was held without a pressure on 19 pass rushes. It is the first time this season that Lawrence has been held without a pressure. Uh, I am not the world's greatest offensive line expert, Anthony Haney, but I have been covering football for a long time, and I feel very comfortable saying that's pretty good. Uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's how good. So the same old line, by the way, that had all that success that we talked about running the football also protected Jaden Daniels. And those things go together, right? The, the protections, the play calls. Um, Cliff did an outstanding job yesterday, and it's just it's a joy to watch their film. It's a joy to watch them play on TV. It's a joy to watch them play in person. It's a joy to watch this offense play. They have consistently just been masterful all season long. They are literally historically great in any number of categories. They are the first team since they started keeping the stats in 1980 to be uh, 11 of 11 during a season on fourth downs. Like, they're every down, every distance – it through the air on the ground. They're one of the best in football, and they they're in Washington with Jaden Daniels and Cliff Kingsbury. What a time to be alive, wearing burgundy and gold. Number six. Uh, with that said, uh, the defense. That is where things get not exactly. Uh, they're, let's just say they're not historic. Um, they're a heck of a lot better than they were earlier this year. But the Giants' offense totaled 148 yards on 27 designed runs against the Commanders on Sunday. They posted season highs in expected rushing yards, EPA per carry, and total yards before contact on design runs. Additionally, ball carriers were contacted behind the line of scrimmage on a season low 14.8 of design runs, 14.8% of design runs, but they accumulated negative uh, rush yards over expected on those plays. So they were able to get further without making contact, but then you think based off of that, they would have actually gotten further on the plays, so the recovery was good from Washington. That was a lot of numbers. Here's the point. The Giants had a better rushing total yesterday, a better rushing output yesterday than they have against any other team this season. That is not ideal. I also think it was part of the game plan. I also just look at that and say, the Giants know that they are going to have to run the football, that that's where Washington is probably weaker. And if you're running the football against Washington instead of throwing the ball to Malik Neighbors, and I'm Joe Witt, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. Okay, cool. I don't think that you can drive 
15 plays and not commit a stupid penalty or not lose your patience and pass the ball and take a sack. And you want to know what? They were right because I've been watching back the defensive tape. So I have a, I'm literally doing this play-by-play because I had a theory on this. It actually wound up being wrong. Um, this was much more about the Giants and their inability to do stuff than it was the Commanders. But you have a one, two, three, four, five, six-play drive where the Giants only faced one second down. One second down. No third downs. First and ten, second and six, first and ten, first and ten, first and ten. But on that last first and ten, you don't know what they did? They fumbled. Because Daniel Jones finally dropped back to pass. And then it took them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 plays to score. You know what's not going to happen? The Giants going on a bunch of 16-play drives. So if I'm Joe Witt, I'm like, go ahead. Our offense needs five seconds. Or if they want to take five minutes, they can do that. It is not ideal, but I do think it was on some level a strategic choice in terms of the aggressiveness to stop the run. And my, my um, experiment, which my, or my theory was that maybe after that 16-play drive that Joe Witt Jr. changed it up and started running heavier boxes. Nope. At, at, for one series, he did. Eight in the box, eight in the box, seven in the box. Uh, on that, by the way... They did try to put the ball in Daniel Jones' hands more because it was an RPO on the first play, and they forced Jones to throw it. Luvu batted it down. They forced a zone read give on the second play, and then Chin had a pass break up on third down when they had to throw it to Theo Johnson. So there they get three and out. They come out in the second half, six in the box, seven in the box, six in the box, seven in the box. There's eight on the fourth and one. Then back to seven, 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 seven. You get the point. They weren't overloading the box. They were like, fine, if you want to run it, run it. And they couldn't because they're the New York Giants, and they're only so good at it. So, yeah, the Giants had arguably their best pass or rushing day of the year based off all those numbers I read you earlier, but it wasn't like it was actually anything that was going to beat Washington, and that's kind of the point. Number seven. Because they don't give up explosive plays, and this is the difference in this game versus Chicago and some of the other games. I know they ultimately gave up uh, more points in this game because in that last drive, they did give up chunk plays. And there was a couple, right? J- uh, Jones had a zone read that went for 24. Like, they gave up a couple, but there's no 50-yarders. There's no long touchdowns in this game. And that actually will feed into number eight as well. But if you just can keep the top on, especially a bad offense, eventually they're going to beat themselves. And... If we're being blunt, there's a lot of bad offenses in the NFL. And I don't know. I haven't watched the tape yet. I don't know how good the Steelers are. Like, I don't know if you can do this against the Steelers. You might need to be a little more aggressive in stopping the run because Najee Harris is really good, and then you just hope that Russell Wilson has an off day throwing the deep ball uh, to George Pickens. But, like, most offenses in the 2024 NFL, perfectly fine strategy. That brings us to number eight. Number eight. Um, It's pretty clear that this team needs a number one corner long term. Um, you know, I've tried to be a Benjamin St. Juice truth sayer, and people hear what I say and take it to mean that I think Benjamin St. Juice is awesome. Benjamin St. Juice is not awesome. Benjamin St. Juice is frustrating because he's so close to being really good, but I've seen enough of Benjamin St. Juice over the course of his time here in Washington to know he's an average corner, which means when he faces Malik Neighbors, there's going to be some problems. With that said, some of the biggest stuff he gave up to Malik Neighbors wasn't really on him. There's that deep crossing route that he gave up in the third quarter that it's cover three. He's supposed to be deep into the outside. Now, could it, uh, does a better corner match that better and realize I'm good here and cut hard on that? Probably. Is Bobby Wagner supposed to be underneath that throw as an underneath player? Yes. Yes, he is. Uh, The Darius Slayton dig, I think, or curl later in the game. That's actually the one that I'm like, that's the one that kills you, is he just is too slow recognizing some of these routes. But, but, here's my defense, if you will, of St. Juice and why I think he works in this defense and why they've been able to be so successful. He's not getting beat deep. He is straight up not getting beat deep. He would rather give up a 15-yard comeback route than get beat on a double move, and so he's not overreacting to that stuff, and that does not leave him exposed on the double moves that got him beat against, say, Jamar Chase earlier this year. You can win like that, not against the best of the best of the best of the best, because they will go and take those 15-yard chunks and march down the field. But against the Giants fine. If they can get an upgrade by this time tomorrow before the deadline, do it. 1,000% do it. But I think that is the the kind of the reality of St. Juice. Is he going to give up more than he should? 
I would love to see him give up less, but he's going to fight, he's going to compete, and he's not going to give up explosive plays, and you can win like that. Number nine. Jeremy Chin, best game as a commander. Uh, Quinn actually said that at his press conference an hour ago. He thought that was his best game. Dude was everywhere. 13 tackles, 7 solo, 2 tackles for loss, 1 PBU. Um, I really don't understand some of the calls later in the game where, I, and I say I don't understand because I haven't gotten to them on film yet, where they stopped going some of the man-to-man -man stuff and letting Chin guard Theo Johnson because he was awesome. And they get some of the zone stuff that, that there's big holes in. But overall, excellent game from Jeremy Chin. And one more shout-out at the back end here. Number 10. Chris Rodriguez. Talk about staying ready. Everyone can say, oh, I just got, I got to stay ready. It's another thing to actually do it, to be involved. And I thought DQ told a really cool story at his presser today that he, uh, being Rodriguez, saw the way that Jeremy McNichols prepared. And he was like, oh, that's what it means to be a backup and stay ready. And he took on that same attitude, persona, preparation. And he was ready for his moment. And there's a chance that he got called up from the practice squad and then wasn't really needed. And maybe he was going to play on special teams or whatever. But Brian Robinson would have been active. Instead, B-Rob doesn't make it through the pregame warm-up. They decide to go a different direction. And I still don't think that Chris Rodriguez was supposed to be as big a part of that game plan as he was. But he was their best back. So they rode the hot hand. Credit to the staff for doing so. Credit to Anthony Lynn. And then, of course, credit to Chris Rodriguez himself, a guy that has been through, I'm sure, a tough year, didn't anticipate being on the practice squad, but has stayed ready and then came in and did the damn thing. Well done, Chris Rodriguez. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.